With artifacts forged from the melding of science and magic, from the deepest depths of the cosmos, your quest, should you choose it, survive another mission with the Mizwits. The show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring you the news and interviews from the Geekoverse. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me this week is Mike Kafis. What? What? Yes, that's your, what? Yep, mm-hmm, that guy. What? What? My other co-host, Jack Ballard. Good evening. <laughs> we are also joined this week as our guest, Robert Brooks. Howdy. And returning guest, Jason Nelson. Hey, everybody. Yeah, up, so uh, Ro- Robert Brooks is a game designer and film director from New Hampshire. He is the founding. He's the founder of the game studio Exo. Watch me blow this. Imago? Imago? You got it. You nailed it the first time. (laughs) All right, Imago. And it's tabletop game arm Encounter Table Publishing. He is the co-creator of the Aethera campaign setting and contributor to the Pathfinder RPG by Paizo. Uh, Jason Nelson is or has the has a oh my god has been a professional game designer for 15 years working with Wizards of the Coast Paizo and for the last six years with his own company Legendary Games, where he leads an all-star team an all-star team of That's some right. of the best designers in the business creating amazing products for Pathfinder Starfinder and Fifth Edition and I've seen some of Jason's team and that is that is absolutely true you got a, a kick-ass team there Jason. Thank you. So, uh, so yeah, welcome, Jason and uh, uh, Robert. And I want to say, uh, before we get started on anything else, uh, if you've, if you're like, hey, I've heard of legendary games before on, on the Mythwits, you can go back and check out uh, season three, episode fourteen, Trail of the Apprentice, where uh, we did. Uh, I think I think that's the name of the module or the, or the name yep. of the, the the book that you were doing, and then uh, back go back another year, season two, episode twenty three, legendary planet, which uh, was uh, was your Kickstarter for your whole big legendary planet stuff. Yep, and we're still working on that now. I'm sure it will be referenced amply in today's installment. <laughs> I, I'm I am certain of that. <laughs> so, so welcome guys, welcome to the Mythwits. Um, so let's let's just jump right into this because we're running. You know, we got a little bit of a late start because a little bit of technical stuff there, um, and uh, so I want to start with um, with with the alien bestiary because that's sort of the that's sort of the hot topic at the moment that you that you guys are working on, um, and as you mentioned, legendary ties into legendary planet, um, mm-hmm. and tell me tell me exactly how it, is it? It's not a book precisely for legendary planet, is it? it, it or is or is it a legendary planet? Exact well, it, it started off, and you know, the idea. This is something we've kind of working on off and on for a while of creating a monster book that will be specific and a great resource, both for the new Starfinder game and for fifth edition games that want to branch out into more of a sci-fi kind of a flavor. I mean, in my experience, a lot of five E players are more traditional in their taste, but you know, the idea of having you know technology and science fiction in space blended with your fantasy game you know goes back as far as the game does you know at least as far back as when i started playing in 1981 and before that as well with blackmore expedition of the barrier peaks and all of that so it was born out of a desire to create a a great monster resource for that but then it was also born out of the fact that we had a lot of great resources at our disposal not just the monsters that we had already created in legendary planet and not it created them for both Pathfinder and for 5th edition, and that we were already in process of creating for Starfinder, but also we um, co-published the Ethereum campaign setting, which, you know, Robert can talk more about that as well. He had created a bunch of great alien races and monsters for that setting, and so he said, shoot, we've got a lot of great monsters, we've got a lot of great artwork, we've got a lot of great people, why not just take this to the next level and finish that off and create a great monster resource for 5e and for starfighter and and so that's where the idea of the alien best here was born and also it kind of goes in with what are the what are the gaps in the official offerings and good bad or otherwise you know paizo has created the starfighter game system and they've chosen not to create a real monster book per se from the get-go they want to create monsters along the way in their adventure paths for starfighter 
And they also are creating a, a book coming out in October called The Alien Archive, which has some monsters in it, but is somewhat more focused on alien races. And, and so we wanted to, to say there's a good space in there where people really want a great book of space monsters. And yes, it will have playable race in there. It will have robots in there. It will have, you know, evil, more humanoid people type creatures. But we want a lot of monsters there. And that was the root of it. And it gave birth from that point. Now, the project is not just about the alien best here. That's kind of the, the foundation product. But as Robert and I were talking through this process, we talked about what are some ways that we can keep building more out. And one of the products there was what we're calling the Alien Codex, which is in some ways similar to the Alien Archive, but also similar to the Pathfinder Monster Codex or NPC Codex, where you've got focus on different alien races and a ton of stock NPCs, ready-made, ready-to-use stat blocks, Built different roles for those alien races. So you've got humans, you've got you know Clavin shock troopers and Clavin commandos and Clavin infiltrators and Clavin troops. You might have different kinds of you know human bartenders and you know human <laughs> base mercenaries, human gladiators, human right. scouts, human beggars. You know all and all down the list. So for each of your featured races, you would have a bunch of ready-made stat blocks able to you know to drop in any campaign and use that as a great resource when you're writing adventures or when you're just you need a, an NPC on the fly. To go along with that, Robert had an idea. He wanted to make an Ethera campaign setting focused bestiary, which kind of you know, evolved as we talked through it to the Ethera field guide. And I'll let him talk about that a little more here, but the, the Ethera field guide and the alien codex are both stretch goals that are built into the project. Alien based areas, best areas, kind of the um, like I said, the foundation product. But as we go along, we'll be adding not only more monsters to that, but we'll be unlocking and opening up these companion books, the Alien Codex, and adding more races to go along. We'll be adding the Alien NPF Theory Field Guide, and we'll be expanding the scope of what that hits. And so it's really about providing you a very robust selection of monsters and fantastic space themed aliens, which will include some of the classic space themed monsters that Pathfinder has developed along the way translated into a way that is more suitable for Starfinder and for 5e. We're not talking about necessarily a, an exactly straight across one-to-one -one conversion. The idea is to take monster and to recreate it in a way that really works for the destination game. But Robert could talk a little more about the, uh, the Ethereum field guide because it's, he's got a very cool take on another different flavor of what you could say is a monster book, but it goes far beyond that. Okay. Hey, yeah. so what's up with that? Yeah. So um, one of the things I wanted to do was not just produce a, like a standard stock best area. That's just like monster, 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 monster. I, I was always interested with uh, naturalist field guides from like the, uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s that had like pictures for identification of them in the wild, things about their habitat and ecology. So I, I want to produce a, um, a monster book that delves really deep into the the ecologies and um, habitats and biologies of the creatures that's divided up in kind of a almost nonsensical like um, early 1900s classification of them so instead of using the actual creature types to divide the book up it's divided up by what the people in the universe might see them as so there's like biologic creatures and then there's arcanics which are just like anything that's magical and weird and then there's anomalies for like oozes and undead and stuff that just doesn't seem to be bound by natural laws and the way the book's going to present them is they're going each creature is going to have a minimum of two pages and then we want to do upwards of six per cre six pages to include like information about how they fit into the world um what the mythology around them is like what you can do with like their parts if you take them apart and like try and use their body components for magic and any other kind of player related rule for it and also oh, just like artwork that's like sketches and stuff of the monsters more than just the single picture of it so like having like pictures of its like layer and like where it lives and all that oh you know i i gotta tell you i like i really like that concept of being able to use the creature um so that you know what, what they can be used for can you eat them can you extract oils from them can you use their skin for armor because 
I, I can't tell you how like how boring it is in a campaign if you just go around and monsters are only worth whatever treasure they're hoarding in their treasure type or the experience mm-hmm. they give you. You know, I, I mean, I, and there are you know story elements that that go along with monsters and stuff that that are interesting. But it's really cool if you're playing like let's say you're playing a character who's who's into that. You know, like it's like oh we got to go kill this thing. Why? It's not really you know it's not really bothering anybody all that much. It's like yeah, but it's scaring the natives and they'll pay us to kill it and then I can cut out these glands and use that oil as a uh, you know as a, a poison or, or, a, or I don't know make some kind of magic lanterns out of it or something Mike, yeah Mike their Holmes. eyeballs are worth a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> right eyes yes <laughs> so yeah that's, that's something that we I, I've wanted to do for a while I know Paizo is doing some stuff similar to that in uh, the Monster Hunter Codex and uh, Ultimate Wilderness but uh, I'm going to kind of take the rules in a different direction that also meshes with those concepts um, but I think there's a really good way to, to balance it and make it both fair and fun mm-hmm. right so hey Jack first Jack. edition D&D and the, okay. it was kind of like a butcher shop sometimes you kill a monster and you're alright maybe you need the liver for this I need the seal <laughs> <laughs> I have thing in this brain that the brain fluid mean all of that. I mean, it was, yeah, yeah. it was grizzly. So, so Jack, between the three of us, so Jack is Jack is the. It's so it's so funny. Jack, you're the D and D player amongst me and Mike and you. Yeah, right? yeah that's I mean, really weird. <laughs> no, it's kind of weird because no, because I do you know I've been gaming forever. Mike has been gaming for a long time and stuff. But but uh, but of the three of us, Jack and and his uh, girlfriend, they play D and D. So Jack, do you guys play Pathfinder Five E? What do you, what type of D and D are you playing? Uh, five Five E and uh, and you know Pathfinder has been flirted with a few times, but we've never really delved into it. No. Now, are the people in your group stuck on fantasy, or do you think they would want to? They'd be able to stretch out. I think I think they're pretty stuck on it. I would love to. Like I see that Return of the Jedi book in the background there, and <laughs> honestly, that's that's uh, that's pretty exciting stuff. So I would love to branch out some more. I don't think the people in the group are, are too into it though. I know that they would definitely be into hacking up um, various creatures and using their body parts <laughs> for things because that it does sound fascinating. Maybe some sort of hallucinogenic liver or something. I mean the. the it's, 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 it's the limit. <laughs> right. That's now, cool. it's funny. I actually got a question um, from one of our you know Kickstarter folks today who said, look, I don't play sci-fi. If I were to buy this book, can I use it in a regular fantasy campaign? So I actually have just addressed this uh, issue with, with him. It was the same. And when I told him, look, 80-some percent of the monsters in here, you could easily use in any fantasy campaign, and nobody yeah. would know anything about it. There's nothing any weirder than these. It's any stranger that a beholder or an aboleth or a mind player or a gibbering mouther or an intellect of our or right. any number of a hundred different screwball things, ot yugs and mimics. So yeah, most of these creatures you could just drop in there. You don't have to tell them the fact that you're getting out of the alien codex. It's just another monster. Right. You know, there will be a certain subset of monsters that are technological in nature. So whether you use them in a fantasy campaign kind of depends on your tolerance level. Give me an example sure, of technology, technological monsters. I'm just curious. So, well, robots. For one, you know, there will be all kind of robots in a, oh, well, in a okay. space I was... sci-fi kind of game. <laughs> that's, that's the primary example. But also oh. monsters who interact with technology and electricity on energy who have specific abilities that are related to that kind of thing. So oh, yeah, it's just I'm like, like, picturing cybernetic yeah. porcupines and all know. of that. Oh, yeah. There's like a Sorry, cybernetic you know, squid Michael. thing in the art I've seen. I'm I'm not sure what it is, but there's some kind of like space helmet wearing cybernetic octopus art. I'm I'm still amazed by it every time I see it. Yeah, but but you know you you could very easily say that there's some cult that they're going up against, and and you you know you get there and it's some kind of weird cult and they're wearing squid leg masks or whatever, not saying any names, and you know and a portal opens up and this creature comes through and you describe it as yeah it's a big metallic. It's a creature with metallic scales and it's making weird noises, this humming and this whirring and, you know, and then, um, you know, and, and it's just a creature from another dimension that they've summoned in. They don't exactly. have, it does it's, they don't have to know it's a robot. You stab it and you get, you know, you get splashed with, with burning fl- or this fluid that burns your eyes. You know, it's hydraulic fluid, oh. but you know, it's, <laughs> it doesn't yeah, exactly. Yeah. There will be a very few monsters in it that are specifically and explicitly all about space, like say a space whale that you would use as you know <laughs> an organic spaceship. You sort of fly in, but you could say, well, it's a space whale from the astral plane, or it's mm-hmm. just from some mm-hmm. other dimension. 
So a very small number would be ones that you'd really have to squint pretty hard to say it's not a space monster. But most of them, easy. So even if, you know, like your group, they're pretty much, you know, straight down, you know, fantasy mainstream, you can use almost everything in this book pretty easily in a fantasy campaign. If there are non-player character, you know, stats blocks where they've got a laser pistol, you can change that into a bow or one of magic missiles or whatever, and boom, you're good to go. Right, right. Or Fantastic. you just pick up the 500-page Athera campaign setting and hit your players about the head and neck until they think it's a good idea to use right? that. Yeah. You just force them to the be. Other. Yeah. But <laughs> show them the, the bard archetype that has fiery guitars, and they'll do it. Right. <laughs> yeah. and if I can be the doof warrior from Mad Max, fine. Yeah. <laughs> if there's a great example of that sort of system crossover, because here's a book that's 587 pages long. There's about 140 or so pages of Pathfinder mechanics in it, give mm. or take. Which means that even if you curse the day that Pathfinder was born, you could still get 440 pages of rich, delicious, awesome setting material that you could use with Traveler or Star Frontiers or GURP Space or whatever system you wanted to because it's just a very deep and evocative and very cool, very very intricately woven and very unique kind of a space setting. And Robert can talk a little more about the what makes if there are so cool that when I give people sort of the elevator pitch, that's the thing that I think is most cool about it is yeah, that it's sort of a bounded system. And among other things, the dead can't get out. Space is full of ghosts because everybody's <laughs> stuck inside this barrier. And <sighs> that causes some sort of terrible things to happen inside and people get very unhappy. But Robert gave you a lot more details on it. But the idea that it's a, a system sort of set apart. Wait and so you can easily so, so drop it into any other kind of a sci-fi setting without disrupting it or the setting around it. Sure. So so the ghost can't get out. So if you kill something, you're just creating another ghost. Like, so do I do I let it live and have to deal with it, or do I kill it and deal with the ghost of it? <laughs> <Is> that... <laughs> That, that's kind of that's kind of the uh, the thrust of a lot of the, the dilemmas is either the the spirit will just wander aimlessly through the black depths of space only mm -hmm. to like drift into a ship that's passing by and cause all sorts of havoc or it'll get caught up in these like currents that bring the soul back to one of the suns which grinds it down and then sends it back on like a reincarnation cycle so either someone's just going to get reincarnated they might not remember who they were or they're going to become some sort of space ghost um no credit to the hanna barbera show <laughs> <laughs> um but the the setting since jason tossed it back there it's 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 deco punk it's like a 1920s or a 1930s 1940s visual aesthetic so you've got like battleships in space kind of stuff everything's analog there's no computers um you know you've got a stick ship jack wait Wait a minute, no computers. Jack, you would love this place. It's you should play this. I, live, I already live there. That Deco <laughs> Punk is, uh, I'm going to get that on my knuckles. That's going to be. Uh, <laughs> that would work as a knuckle tattoo, too. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's how I do that. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a fun setting. It's it does a lot of stuff that I haven't seen before, but it's also inspired by things I really liked growing up, like Dark Sun. Um, just kind of like grabbing that same vibe of like. The planes aren't going to help you. The gods are gone. No one's going to come to your aid. Kind of bootstrap yourself and run headlong into danger. I see. All right. Well, um, let's go. Let's take a step back real quick because I saw one of your looking through your looking through your Kickstarter. I want to touch on this one thing first, and and I want to go through the Kickstarter real quick. Uh -huh. um, but I saw some clear. I saw some clear miniatures you had, and they look. You know, similar to uh, this style here. Yep. Is this? Uh, do you have Arknight making these? Is this? Is this yep. in a co uh, cooperation on. with Arknight? Okay. Yep. They're fantastic, by the way. I mean, if you guys are thinking about it and you're seeing th these things are awesome. I really, I dig them. I th honestly, they're they're even easier to imagine in some ways as the as as 3D miniatures. They're they're really cool, and you can see through <laughs> them the parts that they don't take up. So it's you know, it's not like a big blocking thing that you would have with the paper ones. It's you know, they're really cool. They're also there's if you go to convention I think they're super light they're super yes. thin and yeah. the, the plastic is very durable so it's not like they're, they're you know, tear like cellophane they're actually you know right. pretty tough and oh they are still, so if someone tips over their bottle of Mountain Dew you're good um, right but yeah the archetype figures are very cool and I think they give a great look also for the sci-fi aesthetic 
So I think sure. the, the Clear Mini really worked well for that. And we worked with Arknight before. We've got some sample Arknight, you know, minis from one of our previous Kickstarters up there. And we were very happy to partner with them again on this. And we're, we've already unlocked uh, the first stretch goal, which is creating the first set of alien pawns. And we will be creating many more of them, you know, as we go along in the process. Right. If you, and like, if, like you're saying, if you go to a convention, right. And you want to take these to a convention with you, there you go. That's the room they take up. You go, mm-hmm. I have like a hundred of these things in two zip, two little Ziploc bags, two like sandwich baggies. Right. So you could take all the miniatures you want and like, I mean, you could, you could take hundreds of them in like a gallon Ziploc bag. Uh, whereas, you know, you need those, ca- you know, like the special cases with the foam to put all your, and you don't have to paint these. Look, I didn't paint anything. I think they're <laughs> awesome. I, I love them. I love, cause I hate painting miniatures. I used to like it a long time ago, but as my time has dwindled away, I, I just don't have time to do it anymore. I found so, I didn't have the manual dexterity for it. I, I have a few very poorly painted minis from back from my feeble attempts. I inherited a bunch <laughs> of lead figures from a guy who rage quit my game about, you know, a dozen years ago. So that's where most of my minis came from. But but these are very cool, and that's just like the, the first of our stretch goals already accomplished. We funded less than 20, from 48 hours. We've already ran through our first stretch goals. Next stretch goal is something we've done, in, again, in previous Kickstarters, which is we let backers help pick what monsters go in the book. Obviously, we've got a lot of monsters that we're going to put in, and we will you know, massage exactly which monsters go in there to make sure that everything's balanced once the backers have their say. But every, you know, so many thousand dollars that we raise, We'll add another group of monsters. The first one coming up is Cosmic Construct. So you want to add Junk Golems or, you know, Myrmidon Warbots or, you know, if whatever kind of, you know, androids, walking eye robots, arachnid robots, you want to add them, the backers get a vote and say which ones are going to be in the book and which aren't. Well, we may later add some more in there if we want to kind of fill in the cracks, but the ones, the five that they vote for, those will definitely be in the book. We move on Alien Animals, Interplanetary Plants. And, you know, so on down the line, meteor monsters and moon mutants, you know, so bring up these categories of monsters that uh, fans will vote on and see which ones they want to make sure definitely get in there. And as okay. we go on, of course, then we'll be adding more crit, more race of the alien codex. We'll be adding, like Robert said, with, we start off with the alien, uh, the therapy of God with the biologics. After we hit the next stretch goal, then we have the mechanics. Next stretch goal there, we add the anomalies. So, yeah. It's all built to continue adding more and more value as we go along, and we unlock the new stuff. You, the base pledge is for just the Alien Bestiary book. If you want to add on these other things, you can do it all with card. You can add in you know, one of these uh, bonus books, add both of them. And if we go so far and up, if the project you know, continues to really succeed, we might cut off where this Alien Bestiary is, create that book, and then begin book work on Alien Bestiary 2. So we'll just kind of see how far people want to push it. But sure, if we, sure. we we don't want to be a monster book that's going to end up taking a year to finish because we got so many stretch goals. So at a certain point, mm-hmm. this book is done. We move on to the next one. Yeah. And so, hey, my team. Let's let's do this real quick. Let, let's just go through this real quick. I, I'm sorry, uh, um, Robert. Do you, you want to no, say something fine. before we go through it? No. Nope. Okay. All right. So I'm go- we'll go through it. And Mike, you just scroll along. I'm going to read these off. I, okay. I collected sure. all this stuff. I did a little – did a little uh, – Front loading on this one. All right, so $25 gets you Space Cadet, which is the PDF version of the Alien Beast Bestiary for either Starfinder or 5e. For 40 bucks, you hit the Interstellar Space Cadet. Uh, it's a PDF of, of both of those books. Um, the Interstellar prefix basically means you got both systems. Okay, so all right, so all right, all good. So I don't, I don't have to repeat those. <laughs> right. So then when you go into the next level, the $50 level, there's Space Ranger, and that's the, the hardback versions of, version of either Starfinder or 5e. For $90, you get both. For $100, that's the Alien Bestiary... Oh, I can't even talk tonight. Alien Bestiary hardback and PDF uh, for either Starfinder or 5e, plus the Explorer pack, which is a button, a spinner, lapel pin, t-shirt, dice, and dice bag. Uh, for 140 <laughs> that's the Interstellar version. Um, for 400 you get the Prince or Princess of the Universe, Alien Bestiary hardback, PDF, Starfinder, or 5e, the Explorer pack, uh, and the Star Commander hurry, There's pack. only 29 left. No, 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 no. We're almost done. Laser pointer, drawstring bag, power bag, USB. Not left for the <laughs> Prince of Princess. Hey, hurry up! 
Uh, four forty for the Interstellar version of that, and for five hundred dollars, you get yep. the Galactic Emperor. You get all the amazing awesomeness of everything from the princess, princesses uh, of the universe, and uh, plus you get to celebrate a victory feast in person with the legendary games at PaizoCon or Gen Con twenty eighteen. Uh, does not include travel costs. In addition, you automatically get to leave behind some space graffiti and get to choose one of the following sponsorship fees hologram designer xenobiologist or join the space program now let's talk about these add-ons real quick let's go through this i don't want to i don't want to get too late into the show uh what is the hologram designer real quick all right so all of those are basically opportunities for you to have some creative input into the book the space graffiti is basically you get to name a person place or thing that appears in one of these books in this case most likely one of the you know, the alien codex or the ethereal field guide the hologram designer is you get to sponsor an illustration. You got to say, here's the here's an image that I want to see show up in the book. The um the Xeno Ballads, like it's called, is you get to basically claim a monster and say that one's going to be in the book. So instead of having to worry about it, who gets whether it gets floated or not, you say, Nope, I want the um you know garbage collector droid to go in the book. <laughs> here's my 150 bucks. Garbage collector droid is in. And right. we'll make an illustration for it. We'll send you an illustration and all that. Um, and the Join the Space program is, is very similar to that. So in, for like the Alien Codex, instead of us creating just a general NPC, you say, here's the character that is my guy. He's one of these races. And you basically send us you know, your character or work with us to create a character that is uniquely yours. Again, gets illustrated. You get the illustration. And you can have that kind of personal input into the creation of the book. You join the space program. Hey, that's me. I'm in the book. We've done that before with a lot of our Kickstarters. We've had a great response. People, people have been so gaga when they see the art that we have created. That they've, you know, they've had a hand in creating. They, they have described it, whether it's their own personal player character or some sort of a scene or a character or a coat of arms or flag or whatever. We just did our Forest Kingdom campaign compendium, and that book was, you know, the, the higher end pledge was the Royal Court. People have got to create a coat of arms, and they got to have a portrait of their character and design a little bit of a kingdom. And people were like, this is the coolest thing ever. I just, I love what you've done with it. We've got a fantastic team of artists from all over the world. And it's something that people have been very enthusiastic about in past Kickstarter. So I'm, I'll be interested to see what people contribute and bring to the table with those. It's, in a nutshell, though, it's just an opportunity for people to be, to bring their creative input and say, this is what I want to see in the game. There's actually even one more bonus level where you can create your own new monster, the the Xenobiologist uh-huh. is finding monsters that already exist uh-huh. and make sure that's going to go in. But the credit, you know, give birth to a star feature, the star spawner. He's like, no, I want to make a new monster. They work with our design team. We create a brand new monster that's entirely theirs. Uh, so, I see. So Jack, on. Jack could create but, a monster that destroys computers. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's called the Mythwits. No. Uh, <laughs> Jason, Robert, all right, first of all, you guys have buried the lead. All right, Pete. I want you to make sure you want to, that this is this is front and center. Um, is, oh God! At, at the Explorer oh, Pack. Jesus Christ! <laughs> no Here we go. <laughs> How do you not say, first and foremost, that you get a light up fidget spinner? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for God's sakes, that is a bestiary of itself. Okay. <sighs> you know what's funny? It's originally um, Rachel Ventura, my business director. She had put the the swag packs up near the top of the description. I said, look. We got to move those down. We want people to read about what the project is about. We want to kind of get the idea of the books, the text. If people are interested in that, they'll scroll down for it. But shoot, maybe she was on the top. Maybe I should have left. <laughs> yeah, listen to her. You put the fidget spinner at the top. But That's wait, it. scroll farther down and see the uh, the Star Commander pack where you've got the the pen laser pointer. You've got the um, the digital uh, <laughs> Robert like this. What was it? The um, with the, the flash drive or the no, there's a there's a battery like a phone charger, right. like it's yeah, like a battery charger, thing, like, like uh, cigarette lighter size phone charger. I mean, much cooler. Huh. It's no, no fidget spinners. That that's that. <laughs> there we go. I mean, that's all cool, but no, you don't, you don't is, understand the Mike how many the, yeah. how many players are ADD and ADHD. Jesus. All right, moving on past the the spinner. <laughs> uh, so the that's stretch goes already... though for real, for real. That is good. <laughs> You already talked about the Alien Codex, uh, Etheria Alien uh, Field Guide. I think you, you touched on that, right? Yep, yep. Okay, and then Alien Beast Jerry 2, which is just more of the same goodness, more of the good. 
Uh, so, so, all right, Mike, let's go back to, let's go back to this. All right. So, uh, you know, if you guys are interested in the, the Kickstarter, it looks really cool to me. I'd say, you know, go check it out, see if it's something you want to back. Um, sounds like it's got a lot of great, awesome stuff. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the Ethera campaign setting. So it's, it's for Starfinder, right? And for, uh, and for 5e. It's for and, Pathfinder, actually. We're working on getting oh. some stuff ported over to Starfinder and 5e. The, the bestiary okay. section is the first real part we're moving over to Starfinder and 5e. Oh, I it was see. kickstarted a okay. couple years ago for Pathfinder. I see. Okay. And all right. All right. So that's what Jason was talking about, how it's like 580 some odd pages of like book, but 120 ish of those are what's really like Pathfinder mechanics. The rest of it's like setting material. Got it. All right. Um, All right. Okay. Makes sense now. All right. It's a little, it's a little going to be tricky to, to convert it all over because there's so much um, of the setting that's, we didn't just like say like, okay, there are fighters and clerics and whatever in the setting. Um, We drilled down into them and we're like, in the setting, this is what they do in society. These are what their roles are. And Starfinder and 5e both have very different class options. Um, a lot of the stuff that built the identity for Athera came with um, Pathfinder's Occult Adventures, which has like psychic magic and a lot of other stuff like that. So we have to either find analogs or build stuff from the ground up. Um, what we're looking at for that is probably doing a, um, a conversion guide for it, uh, more so than a, a dedicated printing, but that's not off the table. Um, we're still kind of looking into it. The okay. uh, the field guide will be for all three, um, Pathfinder, 5e, and Starfinder. Mm-hmm. Okay. And all right. I just, well, about the Alien Bestiary, the original idea of the project was that we would create it for Starfinder and 5th edition, because we figured, look, a lot of the monsters we're bringing in are monsters that already exist in Pathfinder, but We've gotten a fair number of requests saying, hey, how can we not do this for Pathfinder 2? And we said, well, we would either make a much smaller book, just the new stuff, or we could make a large book that would be reprinting stuff from a lot of resources that you might already have from Pathfinder Bestiaries or from Adventure Paths, which we could do. It's all OGL. But <clears throat> at the same time, we wanted to make sure, well, is that something people have a good appetite for? And so we are leaning towards going and adding back in a Pathfinder version of the Alien Best here as well. The exact form that takes, we're still kind of massaging to figure out what's the best way to make that happen, but we may be adding back Pathfinder as a system for this as well. Okay. All right. Very cool. Yeah, I was having a hard time. I, I was like looking, I'm like, is it Pathfinder? <laughs> is it Starfinder? Because it, the whole Pathfinder, Starfinder thing is, is uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it's even more confusing because when we when we put out our Kickstarter for the Ethereum campaign setting, um, the back in like two years ago, uh, it was before Paizo announced Starfinder. And uh, at PaizoCon, the the May following when we funded in November, uh, Wes Schneider, the editor in chief at the time, pulls me aside and he's like, "We have to talk." <laughs> and uh, he gave me a little heads up about it uh, and let me right. know what was kind of going on with it. So it was a an interesting confluence of circumstances. Right, yeah, the same right. kind of thing with Legendary Planet. We had been, you know, we kind of announced it in 2014. We ran the Kickstarter for it in 2015, like we had, we're on your show. And we had already started putting out the first several adventures for it. And all of a sudden, oh, well, hey, now there's Starfinders. So <laughs> what are Great. we going to do with that? Right, and eventually right. decided, well, shoot, we've got it, uh, gone this far. May as well get it out, you know, put out. And you'll see there's the Legendary Planet starter set. You can order as an add-on pledge. Because we have it available for all three systems now, we're still kind of catching up with Starfinder, obviously, because there was only so much that we could do prior to the uh, prior to the release of the rules, even with the you know, early access to it, as a lot of third-party companies had. Um, and we've been pushing forward mainly on the to complete the mission on the Pathfinder and the Five E side, while we're also catching up and releasing related products for Starfinder or for Five E for Pathfinder. Games like we have a legendary world series that are kind of ready to play planets. When you've got about a 20 or so page product where you've got you know, a, a new planet to go explore, you've got sort of history, geography, politics, society, brand new monsters, some new rules that are relevant to that particular society. You've got you know a map of a planet or of, a, of an area on it. And of course, most importantly, adventure hooks for why you're here or yeah. want to go there. So right. if they take a left turn at the, at the nebula instead of a right turn, you say, shoot, where are they now? Hey drop them into one of these legendary worlds and we've got a whole line of those up for all three systems so we're broadening out what we have in, out there for sort of the legendary planet verse even as with a theorem 
We've got the the Korra Thera book. We've got It's Era Heroes, which is a lot more World War Plus ready uh, to go um, create characters for five different races. Humans, the Okanta, the Infused, the Phalanx, and the... Um, Urathi. Yes, the plant people, Urathi. <laughs> um, and we've got some um, additional adventures coming out. We've got a bunch of stuff in the pipe, but uh, isn't we got another Ethereum adventure coming out fairly soon, right? Yep. Yep, there's five so, adventures in the pipe right now. I have all the irons and all the fires. <laughs> yeah. right, so, hey, Mike, could you click on in the in the doc? Could you click on that first link for the Ethereum stuff? I'm going <clears> to <throat> share and I'll share your page. Yes. Uh, Robert's a great graphic designer, so his stuff looks very shiny. <laughs> <laughs> it's very shiny and pretty. You got it, buddy, there? You got that? Yeah, I had to go to the other computer, though. And sharing the page. And the Athera setting not just has that sort of deco punk aesthetic, but also it's got elements of kind of your thirties and forties noir plot and yep. along with the infusions of a bit of cosmic horror alongside your sci fi and your fantasy. So it's not just in the appearance and the look of the books, but also yeah. the feel and the flavor. Yeah, so, I'm hey I'm Good. Hey Robert, can you can you talk us through this a little bit? So Mike, mm -hmm. scroll along with him. So we got the wor we're showing the worlds here. Yep. But it's a slick map, by the way. Hey Mike, roll it down a little bit. Very Show that cool map, map off. That's pretty. It's got links and stuff in it too. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Oh look at that. Yeah, you can click on each one of them to view details about each of the uh, the plants or stars in the system. It gives you a little bit of information about what the the settings like. It's uh, just the ones down at the bottom. Into it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. I was looking at this earlier, and I was like, "Wow, that's very pretty, very nice." The rates of section has a uh, a bit of information on that too, all the different species and inhabitants of the system, and kind of like who they are and what they are. Um, right. The uh, the visual style we wanted to nail for it is definitely like that uh, that thirties forties Art Deco kind of vibe. Right. Um, that then interfaces with like like Jason was saying, I'm a big fan of cosmic horror and space horror, and uh, there's a series of creatures that are basically the Cenobites from Hellraiser, but in space. Um, in and because because I'm a big fan of like Event Horizon right. and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah. Anything that, stuff, yeah. anything that's just weird and bizarre and strange, I tried to kind of meld it into this and then give it a new visual <laughs> style and a different twist to make it all feel fresh. So it's there's a lot of familiarity in the setting, but when you look at it all as a whole, you're like, oh, okay, these things haven't been really put together like this before. I'm gonna click on the inhabitants yep. here. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. So then here's your rate the races you were talking about. So you got the, the yep. infused and the And now what are the infused? They're like kind of like a techno person. They're uh they're like actually they're they're humans that were um the I have to backtrack a bit. Uh the the conceit of the setting is that there's a magical power source called Aetherite. It's basically um crystallized magic and it's a, a relatively rare resource that spawned like a resource war, which is kind of like the backdrop for the history of the setting. And the infused were created during this war. They were human volunteers at first and then like prisoners and then just whoever they could get their hands on. And they liquefied this crystallized magic and injected it into their veins just to see what would happen. Oh, I, I want to do that. I'll sign up human, for that. The human culture basically built them into these like weapons, but it erased their memories in the process. So mm -hmm. they didn't remember who they were or what they were fighting for. And then when they were replaced by machine soldiers later on, they were basically just cast aside. So they're veterans who the state has basically said, no, too bad, so sad, go away. You're a reminder of horrors of war. So please don't mm -hmm. get in our face. So you get, and their their lifespan is artificially shortened by the process too, and they can't reproduce. So as a species, they're dying out very rapidly. And the thrust of playing one is that your life is both unique and extremely important and possibly the last of your kind. Uh, okay. Okay. And well, then... You um, got some bestiary types there too. <laughs> Yeah, they are standard animal people, but I really like them. <laughs> Just right. there's nothing that says fun like a giant lion person who can beat you with an anvil on a stick. Right, right. And, and the animal people are a little unique in that they're they kind of remind you of, of the Trollocs from the Wheel of Time, and that they don't yeah. all look the same. They're not all minotaurs. They're not all you know hyena people. They're not all dog people. They can all be all part of the same species, but the specific animal manifestation get varies widely across you know what they look like. 
Yeah, so you're the saying lion that's headed. that one that looks like a furry, like a bunny man, or uh, yeah, actually, yeah. I did a uh, a demo of the game uh, at PaizoCon this year with some contributors, and one of the players created a uh, basically a jackalope. It was a rabbit-headed one with antlers, uh, and it was it was pretty great. <laughs> nice. The uh, the phalanx are like living machines. Um, they have a soul which wasn't intentional in their creation. Um, they're analogous to the Warforged in Five E. Um, huh in that they were created to kind of replace the infused um, and they've been emancipated since the end of the war and they're trying to discover like what culture and identity is for them. Um, but they also have flashbacks of past lives that they've never lived. Um, they'll remember fa like human families and other bizarre things. They'll get pastiches of experiences um, that they never had lived and figuring out how that makes them a person as well. Hmm. Very cool. All right, all right, very cool. So there's a really neat setting. Um, I think I think it's uh, definitely something to check out. I I mean, even look, I, I'm a big fan of of like bringing stuff in, even if you uh, even if you don't play that particular game. I I I don't know if this is a heresy to say this, but I'm like, but they're still buying your book, right? I'm like, because because my point is is that even if you don't, because our group does that, we're like we hack we we bash, you know, we kit bash games all the oh, yeah, time. Yeah. So this is yep. something like I could see us using this as a world that we, our characters would go to. We like to play a lot of games where we travel interdimensionally, um, <clears throat> which is why I liked Legendary Planet so much because it was it was just, it was cool. I was like, oh, yeah, this is right up our alley. Um, yep. But this is something where I could see you know like Mike playing Fringeworthy, where we would uh, we like, yep, oh, yep. well, here's a world we can go to. You know, and it's Indeed. it's very well like fleshed it. out. Yeah, it definitely is fleshed. You guys do good good work, good art, um, yeah. a lot of good material. So. Good on you. I guess that's why you're we uh you know we have you back again and again, right? <laughs> yep. So I mean, I mean, and I say that for real. Like um, anyone who is watching this for the first time should definitely go back and watch um, <clears throat> the prior the two other uh, I guess uh, appearances that uh, Jason had and uh, Jason. You had some other uh, gentlemen on too. I don't. I think this is the first time for um, Robert, but yes. there was some other gentlemen on too. Yeah. Uh, Paris Crenshaw was kind of the, yes. the project lead on Trail yes. of the Apprentice, and which was you know a beginner adventure saga that we did for fifth edition and Pathfinder. And actually, I've I've used that one a bunch. I've you know played it with friends. I also have run a couple of D and D summer camps last year and this year at a local game store. Some of the kids had so much fun at last year's camp. They came back for this year's camp. One of the camps we did Trail of the Apprentice, and one of the camps we did the first adventure of Legendary Planet, and. I, I must admit that I did give him a, an old school first ed style, just you know, brutal baptism in gaming. We had <laughs> we had four character deaths in the first three sessions. Right. Um, like your character's dead. Go get another one from the pile. That's the thing under <laughs> form. Pile. Um, All right. But, hey, before before we run out of time, I'm sorry. I don't mean no. to cut you off, but I, I don't want to run out of time before we have a chance to cover. We got one more thing. Is there anything else you guys want to say about like Athera or 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 uh, the bestiary before we move on? We got one more thing I want to talk about before we go. Well, actually, uh, we've, there's actually three things, but one thing in particular. <laughs> there's uh, we have the Heroes for Harvey charity thing going on right now. Yes, um, that's a pack of uh, our our books um, that are 100 charity donations for the people that are impacted by uh, Hurricane Harvey down in Texas. Um, there's links for that all over uh, my Twitter account and uh, probably Jason's too. So if folks are interested, they can go there and find it. All right. All right the, when we give out links, don't let me forget. Okay. Um, the, uh, the bundle is available on drive through RPG. We work with them we, uh, and they were great about how they you know, set it up and help promote it. It's, you know, three of our heroes products, etheric heroes, planetary heroes, and nautical heroes. So these are, you know, in super detailed character, you know, folios with, you know, full color portraits, very deep and rich character history, so world war and connections. They're over 60% off. So it's $9.99 for three of them, which normally costs you like, I don't know, 22, 23, 24 dollars, something like that. So you're getting it all over about 60% off. And as Robert said, all the funds go to three charities. We're supporting the Southeast Texas Food Bank, the Montrose LGBTQ Center in Houston, and Teachers of Tomorrow, which has helped you know, teachers rebuild their classrooms after they've been destroyed by flooding. Oh, yeah, that's good. Good on you. More good on you. All right. So let's let's talk a little bit about real quick. Um, uh, so, so Robert, you have 
parting or parted ways, uh, an upcoming multi-platform adventure game, um, and that that's with your EXO I'm Imago Imago. Yeah, Imago. First time, every right. time. I know, yeah, that's right. a side project of mine. Uh, I'm doing right now. Uh, I spoke to a bunch of people I work with um, for tabletop, and we we had this idea of wanting to do a. Um, uh, a horror themed uh, romance game basically and that kind of spiraled out into creating an adventure game that's set in the styles of something like Twin Peaks and Silent Hill but you're also forging relationships with characters like you would in a Bioware style computer game um, and uh, we just did a uh, an announcement for it um, yesterday actually a press release went out um, and there's a at parted ways game um, you can find that or at exo Amago. Uh, on Twitter and uh, or exomago.com, um, but it's okay. it's a project we're going to be working on in 2018. Um, I've got um, David Gator who worked on Dragon Age, uh, who is going to be working on it with me. Um, we've got a bunch of other really excellent talent, and it's just something I wanted to kind of like get out there in the zeitgeist so that people could be aware that it's something that's going to be happening. Um, but a lot of people that are extremely talented have like reached out to me and been like, hey, can I get a little bit in on this? And I'm, I'm right. just like trying not to give away too much of what we're going to be building towards. But we released some of the character art and spoke about some of the concepts. And that's just something I'm really excited for that's coming in the future. Cool. Cool. OK. And then you have uh, as part of that that effort, you also have uh, uh, the Encounter Table Publishing, which I thought was kind of interesting because um, we, we have a lot of authors, a lot of indie authors come on this show. Uh, and it's uh, the, your mission statement, which which is what I found very interesting, was bringing new and diverse talent into the game industry by finding and developing new voices uh, mm-hmm. through Encounter Table Publishing. We strive to create an environment of openness and inclusion by elevating marginalized voices and offering opportunities to inexperienced and untested voices who may not otherwise have an opportunity to enter the industry so I'm, I'm imagining you're reaching out to a lot of women people of color that sort of thing mm-hmm. yeah yeah um the Athera campaign setting was actually produced by i'd say 60 percent um new talent uh it was people like i'd reach out on social media twitter facebook and the like and i'd say you know i'm looking for new authors i'm looking for people from marginalized backgrounds i'm looking for people who haven't got a chance um and i got inundated with responses so many that i i didn't have enough space to accommodate all the authors and uh for some of our future products i reached out to these new people and it's amazing the the quality of talent that is just sitting out there not getting noticed because either a they don't think they're good enough for whatever reason or b there's just louder people who are advocating for themselves better and Mm, being able to train someone up and get them to have their experiences shown creates a much more interesting and unique product. Um, if anything you've seen in the Athera campaign setting that really seems out of the ordinary or different from the norm was absolutely created by some of the new and marginalized talent that we pulled together in our team. And every project I work on, I try and pull new people who haven't ever worked in the industry together to try and give them a chance to shine, or at the very least, give them a chance to hone their skills. I always give uh, feedback and advice and try and mentor people up through the industry. And then for folks that I can see, like have a knack for it, have an, an aptitude, I'll put them out to other publishers. I've sent folks over to Jason. I've sent folks over to Paizo. I've sent folks over to every other company that uh, I have a good relationship with. And it's been extremely beneficial because the more talented people there are in the industry, the better products there are going to be overall. And the okay. better you know voices are going to be heard. Fantastic. When, when Robert says he's got a great person to work on, I said, let me see what they got. You know, <laughs> And I love getting new talented people. You know, the the legendary game sort of was established itself as a calling card of people who were industry veterans, but we've you know can you know, broaden out our scope of people that we work with as well. And then when I get people who I know and trust who give a good recommendation for somebody and kind of show me their work and say this person is talented, they are timely, and they are you know pleasant to work with. That's pretty much the trifecta of right. <laughs> then yeah, let me out of it. And you, I will you can have too. you can have all that and not be pleasant to work with, and that's it. <laughs> Deal killer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, hey man, I, my stuff is yeah, stuff is excellent, but you're a jerk. <laughs> 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 all right. So before we go, real quick, um, uh, Jason, you had you had said that uh, you, you sent you sent me yours a little bit late, so I'm, I'm squeezing <laughs> it at the end. Um, you have a pirate uh, pirate campaign compendium compendium you wanted to mention. Uh, can you, yeah, like just two minutes I on can. that. Okay, the very first um, print product we did was the Gothic Campaign Compendium, which uh, gathers together all of our sort of horror-themed uh, products together into one hardback book. 
and that was great success and one of our very great products there this summer we did a, a similar one actually spring the forest kingdom campaign campaign which is based on sort of the you know, wilderness adventure and fairies and the fey realm and the exploring and royal tournaments and all that sort of stuff and that you know the book is the pdf should be out in about the next week or two for that and coming up probably in november we'll be launching the next campaign compendium which is the pirate campaign compendium which covers all things nautical you know it, it, it has well five complete adventures you'll have tons of monsters character options ready-made you know characters you have npc stat blocks it's got um, well not sorry ship to ship combat naval combat Got all of that kind of stuff bound up in there. If you're running any kind of a pirate or naval themed campaign, it'll be a fantastic resource. We're doing it for both Pathfinder and 5e, much as we did for the Forest Kingdom. There will be opportunities to do those kind of same special pledges where you get a you know create your own pirate captain or your own pirate ship. You get to design your own pirate flag. Um, so it's part of an ongoing series we have of compiling a lot of fantastic products we've done on themes. With the next about that will be the Demon Crusade. Mm -hmm. campaign compendium oh, okay. we have a far each campaign compendium so on and so forth so that one's coming up probably in november so cool. pirate campaign compendium keep an eye out for it neat and uh and and i had a uh one time i had a, a case of uh i had i had um eaten some tainted pork i think and i had something that relates this next one that rage of worms uh no <laughs> <I'm> kidding <laughs> okay what's 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 rage of worms <laughs> But Sorry. the funny story was Robert and I have been talking about what became the Parted Ways game, I don't know, about two years ago. And we're like, I think it sounds cool. I think we should do it. And we were sort of nibbling around the edges of working on it. But then we kind of kept coming back to the other idea that we had about dragons and a dragon heavy adventure saga. Not just, hey, there's a dragon boss at the end. No, just a metric crap ton of dragons up one side and down the other. But not just, you know, hey, it's Dragonlance again. Let's come up with a very cool and interesting way to to approach it. And Robert and I would be kind of texting back and forth, or <coughs> and we kept coming up with the same ideas at the same time. It's like you know what, this has yeah. got to happen. My and um, and so this is a, 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 a you know one to twenty level adventure song we'll be doing again for Pathfinder and Fifth Edition. It will be super dragon heavy. Robert, you want to give him a, the, like a, a one minute pitch on the. Uh, the plot structure of it. I'll do it less than that. Giant flying continent, dragons, time travel, <laughs> elementals. It's going to be wild. <laughs> it's going to be crazy. I'm there. <laughs> oh, Rage of the worms. Push, yeah, they Crank. push the big red button. They push the, uh, <laughs> Let's go across the sea and we'll conquer these rube natives. Wait a minute. Oh, hold on. It's not what we thought it was going to be. Right. Wait, what did we just break? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, right. no. It's, it's the the, uh, the wheel at the bottom of, of that well and lost, right? You know, they, they turn <laughs> the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> so that'll be coming out. Pro we'll probably be running a Kickstarter on that one in, I'm guessing, April or May, most likely. Um, and we'll be getting, you know, a lot of our authors getting started um, writing on that ahead of time. So we want to have a lot of stuff ready to drop at the time that, you know, the Kickstarter is going. Um, we've got a lot of terrific artwork in for it already. I just sent Robert some more today. Um. Mm -hmm. It's going to be evocative, you know, elements, like you said, elements of, a, of King Kong and that sort of, you know, exploration of the, the mysterious islands, elements of uh, Wakanda and the Black Panther, um, mm -hmm. and a, a few echoes of the Savage Tide adventure path for those who would go back to the, the Dungeon Magazine days, but taking a very different spin on it. Um, but it's going to be exciting. It's going to be a lot of fun. It, it's going to be very cool. And I think we've got a very... And I, I kind of talked about the Ethereum setting. A lot of the elements individually might seem familiar at first, but we're weaving them together in, I think, a very innovative and a very exciting way that people are really going to respond to. And the early arts, the early previews done for people responded very favorably to it. And I'm excited to get that up and running as soon as I finish what I need to do on Lecture. <laughs> <China. laughs> okay. All the irons. All, All the fires. The irons. More, oh, more irons iron. than you have, right? More. <laughs> like, I don't have enough hands. Yep. All right, so so before we go, Jack, you haven't had you haven't had a chance to say much. You want you have any? I've been uh, having technical problems. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Did you wanna you wanna ask these guys about I don't know their the musical tastes or? <laughs> no, after the la the last guest said I was a bully. Oh. <laughs> I, I, 
I dared to ask him what kind of music he liked, and he was like, "Oh, but he liked crappy music." But I, it wasn't my fault. Oh uh, what my is, God. Uh, I usually, I usually tend, I tend to ask the guests that. Uh, so, if you guys wouldn't mind, your favorite musical artist, band, uh, you know, wind chime, whatever, whatever strikes your fancy. What? No judgment, by the way. No judgment at all. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Right. <laughs> I, I gotta say, right now, I just did like a really long car ride yesterday, and I listened to uh, Agnes Obel's album uh, Aventine. It's uh, probably not Jack's thing, but I love it. It's fantastic. There's a track remixed by David Lynch, and I'm a big Twin Peaks fan, so that kind of tickled my fancy too. Oh, I love David Lynch. David Lynch is great. Nice. Yeah. Is, is it kind of awesome. soundtracky type, like like the David it's a Lynch little music? Bit, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because yeah, I have um I have lost the Lost Highway soundtrack that he did. Yeah. With, yeah. Yeah. He did it Trent with Reznor. Um, Trent Reznor. Yeah, that was a fantastic yeah, yeah. soundtrack. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I like Trent Reznor too. That was good. All, all right, right, Jason, well, don't screw it up. Rock and roll. Uh, my all-time favorite band is Van Halen. Classic David Lee Roth. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, Jason's I the dad rock Hagar guy. Hagar here is too. I also love Hagar solo stuff, but uh, Roth, uh, Van Halen is my my all-time favorite. I love a lot of kind of you know, 60s British rock like Cream and Led Zeppelin. Okay. Uh, but I also am a huge fan of soundtracks. Uh, I love Disney music, and I love. Oh gospel. wait a minute! There we go. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, I. You dude, know, I love. I love. I love, I love Van Halen, but uh, I get into trouble with their fans because I really like Sammy Hagar era Van Halen much better than David Lee Roth. They hit number one with Hagar. They never had a number one album with Roth. That's true. That's true. That's true. Cool. Okay. He got a little hot for teacher once in a while. Oh, dude, hot for teacher. That is one of my favorite songs. I don't even like Van Halen, and I like that song. I know you, buddy. I know. (laughs) I love that song. I don't know why. It's just uh, just, awesome. Yeah, it, it is a great song. Yeah. I remember when I was when I was a teenager, I really liked uh, I liked David Lee Roth, some of his solo stuff, which I look back oh. and I'm like, man, a teenage, what was wrong with me? But yeah, you know, really. like his his Ice Cream Man song, and I don't awesome. know. The Ice Cream Man was Van Halen, but then the yeah. California Girls and um, what was the other uh, Crazy from the Heat? Yeah, but anyway, but yeah, Roth's <laughs> early solo stuff, not bad. It kind of started to go downhill after the first album or two, but. Well, you know the joke. You know how they battled each other with their album title names. That's yeah. uh, that's always a classic. Like they they put a, Van Halen put out an uh, or David Lee Roth put out a solo album called Eat 'Em and Smile, and then Van Halen put out an album called OU812. Yeah. And so they would put they play these little jokes with their album titles against each other. And when I was a kid, I thought that was the, about the coolest thing you could do as a rock star. So yeah, <laughs> Sue <Still> rock star man. <laughs> <laughs> all right well let's wrap this up all right everybody let's do this robert has some links uh please go check out his stuff at www.exoimago.com uh, you can check out his facebook page at forward slash a e uh yeah for i'm sorry facebook.com forward slash a e t h e r a r p g uh, and I'm spelling these out because if I pronounce them, they'll spell them oh, yeah. wrong. You know that, <laughs> right? Uh, you could Twitter him at S P H Y N X I A N, and also please check out A E T H E R A P R P G dot com uh, for the for the website and all the links. We have all the links on our on everything. So if you're if you're watching the YouTube video, just click the link down below. Uh, if you're listening to us on the podcast, we put all these notes and stuff in our podcast format. You can actually go into your podcatcher and probably click on it there. Um, so Jason, for Jason stuff, uh, check out – and I can I can just say this one, makeyourgameslegendary.com. That, that's just <laughs> it's, game, not games. Oh, Only sorry. Game. See, maybe I should have spelled it. <laughs> makeyourgamelegendary.com. And then Facebook, yep. the same thing, Make Your Game Legendary. Uh, yep. His Twitter handle is Legendary Games J. Was Legendary yep. Games taken or – it was. was. Other ones? I, don't know like... who, I don't know why. There okay. are a couple of game stores called Legendary Games. There's one in Vancouver, uh, Washington. There's one in Kentucky. I get emails from them every now and then. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, so the like, Legendary... Can't help you. There's another Legendary Games that's just... No, there's one that has your picture, though, right? I Maybe. They might have stolen... If somebody else did steal our logo, actually. There was a game store that totally stole our logo. I, <laughs> oh, well, I have Jesus. a little... I have something, some editing to do on Twitter because I... I was like, I was like, oh, this has got to be their games, their actual company site. 
No, right. no, I yeah. go go. Fix I emailed that, the guy right? about it, but like whatever, you know, I'm not right. gonna fight shit. Ah, well, screw right. it. You know what? He wants to use your logo. He's gonna get inundated now with uh, all kinds of uh, tweets. So screw <laughs> it. <laughs> so, uh, and but make check sure check out the Alien Bestiary Kickstarter for Starfinder Five yep. E, and probably soon for Pathfinder as well. Yep. Yeah. Indeed. Yep. So if you go into Kickstarter, uh, I mean, I got the link here. It's legendary games uh, forward slash alien dash bestiary dash four dash starfinder dash and dash five E dash heart J. But if you just type in alien bestiary, I'm sure it will come right up for it's you. The first yep. level, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. All right, everybody. Let's wrap this puppy up. Uh, I'm going to run the clues off. You've just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Mythwits Podcast. Catch us live on Twitch Mondays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Jump into the chat room and ask our guests questions. If you miss our live show, you can always catch the Encore episode at YouTube for slash Mythwits. We had people in the in the chat room. Nobody asked any questions, but man, were they oh my talking. God, we have, you no, know, but we have been chatting all about Bob Ross and how much of, how about a religion should be should be made after Bob <laughs> Ross. <laughs> so <laughs> what would be like if, if, if it's a crap the internet is a crapshoot. The whole internet oh, is a crapshoot. Rossafarian. That's right. perfect. Right. Rossafarian. <laughs> That's so fun. All right, find us at MythWits.com and on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and Podbean as the MythWits. Well, as MythWits. No the. Uh, do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. Please give us a bunch of stars and review on iTunes. Make sure to share your favorite episode on social media and help spread our goodness. MythWits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. If you'd like us, you're bound to like other great shows there as well. Check us out on TSRPN.com and all the other good stuff there. MythWits is a Creative Commons product. Make sure to check out Sue 187 for more cool stuff. And please join our mailing list. <sighs> Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week, Mike. Ah, just going to make some happy little plants. Just some happy little plants. Here. Just some plants. Real happy. <laughs> <laughs>